All right, so uh, let's get started. Um, so welcome back. Uh, today we will continue our climb up the Ross ladder, a slow, steady climb. And uh, just to give you an idea of you know how long we are going to spend uh, uh, some time learning Ross. Um, so far, we've just have had a very brief introduction to uh, the most basic elements of Ross and how they work. Uh, and uh, my goal is to gradually, within maybe another two lectures and a lab from now, get you to a point where you can write your own uh, ROS nodes in Python or C++, what ha whatever you desire. Uh, and then we'll be ready for our first uh, you know, assignment in this course, uh, which will require you to program your own ROS nodes for some very uh, interesting turtle sim behavior. Um, so, so with that, you know, we, can, uh, we can continue for the next couple of lectures learning these basic concepts. Some of them may seem very straightforward, but as I've always said, the best way to learn ROS is to practice. And so we'll always alternate between a lecture and some lab session where we will you know, do, uh, do the lab run together. Um, so, so, you know, just to recap, uh, so far uh, we sh should be familiar with the idea of ROS nodes, which is the modular peer-to-peer uh, -peer design, sort of the backbone and the main reason why ROS is so popular uh, in robotics. So we know what a ROS master is, we understand what ROS nodes are. Uh, and just, you know, just to recap and really drive the point home, uh, you can have uh, different sort of functionalities and you should think of nodes as functionalities really. That's really the analogy and the way to break down a complex project into a bunch of nodes. Uh, so you know, we may have a camera right here, which is fetching images and, uh, and publishing on some images topic. And another node is, uh, requesting that I want to receive these images and I want to look at where the soccer ball is. You know, we are going back to our very first example. So that node is uh, responsible for taking an image and detecting some orange blob, for instance. Uh, and then there could be other nodes which move the robot towards the ball uh, and so on and so forth. And so what we have really understood is you can break the functionality uh, of a project into these modular nodes and uh, at the back end, not visible to us, Ross Master is the choreographer uh, or uh, you know, the head of the orchestra which is orchestrating this inter-process communication. And so what we see is the following, right? We see these edges, literally we can see them using RQT graph as a tool, uh, and this will give us an idea of how these nodes are exchanging the data in the appropriate way, right? So we've already covered this many, many times. Uh, and you know, we did this uh, in, in this lab session where we use TurtleSim, which is one of the tutorials which is inbuilt when you download ROS. It's a very good platform to learn about these concepts. Uh, we played around with a bunch of different nodes. Uh, the take home message here is that ROS run, package name, node name is how you execute a node in the terminal. Uh, you know, we delved very deep into TurtleSim in particular to get also familiar with, you know, a node is going to publish on some topics, subscribe to some topics. So TurtleSim publishes its own pose, it publishes some color sensor, and then it subscribes to command velocity, which some other node has to publish to. Uh, and then we also touched upon examples of uh, ROS services, and we saw a list of you know, different services within TurtleSim of reset, teleporting absolutely or relatively, and how do you invoke services directly from the command line. Uh, then we similarly, you know, ROS node was one example. We explored many, many different options that you can pass to ROS topic, uh, right from very, very simple commands like listing or info about the topic to uh, somewhat sophisticated commands like publishing, you know, directly on some given topic. So. Uh, I think at the tail end of the lab, uh, we looked at this example where one of the topics was uh, total one command velocity, and then we we wrote a uh, we didn't write a node. We just used ROS topic publish to directly publish something to that uh, to that topic itself. And you know, so the color coding is just there to break out how ROS topic publish worked. So you know, just to give you an idea, ROS topic publish name of the topic in the red the type of message, so we you know, explored the data structure of the twist message as having the components of linear XYZ and angular XYZ as well, and that's sort of the data structure we pass in the green and the total response to uh, you know, either moving once for a certain amount of time or latching onto the message for the rate that you have specified. Okay, so this is so far what we have done. Uh, hopefully you know, this is clear as this is the foundation for whatever we are going to do next. Um, just a little bit of a, like a you know 
public service announcement before we go on to the, the ROS workspace and ROS build. So you may have seen out of practice, out of uh, habit, I launch some nodes and when I have to kill them, you can just use your Linux uh, control C within that session of the terminal or terminator to uh, kill the executing process or the ROS node. And well, that will work, you know, most of the time, uh, there is a correct procedure in ROS to kill nodes. So I should, you know, be more careful or maybe even use this. So the, the real command to kill a node is called ROS node kill followed by the name of the node you want to kill. Okay, so that, that, keep that at the back of the mind, especially because as our code base grows larger on the car, uh, we may find that even though we have control C some sessions, uh, they have not deregistered themselves with the ROS master. Right, so they may still persist for some reason due to delay in the VM or whatever Linux reasons. They may still persist when you say ROS, ROS node list. Uh, you may still find the name of the node which you've actually killed using control C. So if that happens, you can you know, use ROS node cleanup to, to make sure that your ROS node list is also up to date. So uh, you may not have to face this anytime soon, but uh, it is the correct way to kill nodes and ensure they are not doing some, uh, you know, uh, funny business in the background. Okay, so, so today we will look at a different uh, aspect of ROS, but as important as its modularity is how do you actually, you know, build these packages? How do you uh, compile them from source? Uh, and ROS has its own uh, ecosystem or file system called ROS workspaces, which is required for you to follow and adhere to in order to build packages for ROS, right? So, so uh, to, to simply put, when we said ROS run total sim and I was hitting tab and things were auto-completing themselves, uh, you know, two thumbs up because that just worked out of the box. Today, I'm gonna show you why it works. And when you write your own packages and you still want to use these fancy features of ROS, you need to stick to a particular file structure, directory structure, there have to be some specific make files that must be present in the directory structure for ROS to recognize that I should treat this as a package uh, and not just, you know, some random uh, directory on the, uh, on the computer. So, so that's going to be the, the main topic that I want to cover. We might, again, you know, finish a bit early, but that's fine by me. So let's jump into it. So ROS follows a very specific file system for many, many reasons that will become apparent by the end of the lecture today. But what I want you to recall is that term that I have you know, uh, often said that TurtleSim is a package or ROS run package name, node name. And in passing, we introduced this idea that a package is nothing but a collection of uh, source code or nodes or some services or some cons uh, you know, custom message types. Uh, so, for example, uh, geometry messages f is a package, and one custom message type within there is the twist message that we saw in the in the lab session. Right. So, together with with the with the nodes and the services, you can compile them into a special special folder structure that ROS will treat as a package. So that when you say ROS run package name, it knows that this entity is a package. So, you know, I'm going to explain how does ROS know that, and what do we need to follow. And so this structure is, is really what ROS needs to work uh, and um, be able to compile your, your custom uh, code as well. And the goal, uh, as is mentioned here, I won't just uh, read it verbatim, but pretty much it allows you the flexibility to distribute your package very, very well. Right? And that's one of the, the key aspects of ROS where you don't always have to do things from scratch. We will not write our own mapping algorithms from scratch. We will use an existing package that does mapping for us. So let's get used to this idea of what this file structure is, and um, that's basically what the, the meat of today's lecture is about. So we begin with what I call, and this may be a new term that you may not have been familiar with, the build system, the, the compiler, the, the entity or the library or the set of tools which can compile and build your source code. In ROS, that is called Katkin, okay? Katkin is simply the name, it's not supposed to mean anything or it doesn't, it's not an acronym for something. It's simply the name of the build system that ROS uses, it's called Katkin. And uh, as I said, the role of the system, like with any software uh, compilers, is to use you know, some kind of CMake or make file in order to follow the rules that, um, that govern the compilation of any source code. And 
the original system was called ROS Build, which has a more intuitive name, right? The build system for ROS should be called ROS Build. Uh, and it, it, it was used up until uh, 2015, uh, but now more, all distributions of ROS, it's standard to use the Catkin build system. In fact, we will never use uh, ROS Build, even though it says, you know, some older packages are using ROS Build, we are not using uh, packages as old as five years from, uh, from today. So just to give you an idea, though, uh, ROS build was the original sort of uh, compiler for ROS. So you could write a package and use uh, some very specific commands uh, and a very you know, detailed process and procedure to, to build that package to create like binaries or executables from your, from your source code. Uh, and it had some, as is mentioned, issues of uh, you know, standardization. It didn't follow what is called uh, this uh, uh, you know, file, stu uh, file uh, uh, structure standardization. It didn't, uh, uh, this FSN rules, it didn't follow that. And so that limited uh, the use of ROS in particular, right? So uh, after 2015 and moving on to Catkin, it's more easy for even cross compiling things from one platform to the other thanks to, thanks to the Catkin uh, system. And if you're curious what is Catkin, I told you, you know, don't worry too much about the name, but Catkin is some name of a, of a flower from a willow tree. Um, so Willow Garage was the company which initially, you know, packaged Ross, and so I guess that's the connection from a willow tree, and Catkin is the name of their build system. This is just my speculation, so don't quote me on this, okay? So why do we need Catkin? We needed Catkin because uh, Ross built, which was this old system, uh, had many, many problems and bottlenecks. Uh, it's difficult to cross compile, and it was not you know, compliant to this FS, FHS uh, directory system, which is used by uh, many uh, CMake systems today. And so that's why uh, Catkin was, was uh, uh, incorporated into the Ross. What is Catkin? Catkin is CMake. How many of you know what CMake is or have used CMake? Yeah, so you know when you compile things on an OS, you need, uh, no points for guessing, a compiler. And the job of the compiler is to look at where the dependencies of your source code are and fetch that automatically and uh, create these build, build files or executable files and runtime dependencies. Uh, so all that stuff which actually makes your you know, application run in real time. Uh, so that's all handled by CMake, which is this standard beyond ROS. It's a universal sort of software compiling standard. Uh, and so Catkin is CMake plus some features which are specific to ROS, which enables things like finding packages automatically or directly uh, you can CD into a package by just specifying the name of the package. So it enables these functionalities of searching packages, compiling them in a much friendlier, user-friendly format without having to worry about all these uh, you know, uh, different uh, dependencies too much. Uh, and so we'll see how Catkin makes our life easier. There is some additional work required, but that work is much, much simpler to uh, compiling everything from source using CMake and not using Catkin. And so these things will become clear with examples. Okay, so uh, if you don't know what CMake is, I've said it's a widely used standard for compiling code, which has all these useful features of cross compilation and building targets and uh, keeping track of all these files and installation directories on your host OS. Right, so, so when it comes to working with ROS, uh, there's two main reasons why you would want to work with ROS. One is you want to use existing packages in your own project and build them into you know, your project's execution code. And for that, we will use the Catkin build system, which is native to ROS now. But another reason why people work with ROS is when they want to release packages. So this has not happened yet, but one of our goals is in the very near future, uh, F110 would be a ROS package. So when you download the next distribution of ROS, F110 would be available as a package, uh, just like you know TurtleSim. So we are not quite there yet, but the, uh, the, the Bloom tool is the one which is used to release packages. We will not touch this tool at all. Uh, in this course, but uh, again, I want you to know what are the two different sort of workflows when it comes to working with ROS. We will mostly be using Catkin because we want to just compile our own racing projects. So what the hell is Catkin? You know, how does it actually work? Let's get down to business. Um, so this is an example of a ROS workspace. 
So this is literally nothing but a set of folders which have some special names and they need the presence of some special files for them to count as a ROS workspace or a Catkin workspace. I would use ROS workspace and Catkin workspace interchangeably, they mean the same thing. So every Catkin workspace must contain a source folder as is shown here. As the name suggests, the source folder in the workspace is where all the source code for the packages would reside. In addition, there are two more folders which are created by default when you run catkin make. And I'll show you that uh, command by command. We'll also do it in our lab. But those two folders usually are the build folder and the uh, dev folder or develop, develop folder. Sometimes there's another folder called install, which I'll explain you know, why that exists. But at the very least, these three folders must exist in a catkin workspace. So once again, we have a folder called source, we have a folder called build, we have a development folder, uh, and then sometimes we have an install folder. For the most part, we will never really touch any of these uh, trailing folders. We will mostly, almost exclusively work with the source folder and let Catkin do its job to create the default build files and target files uh, in the corresponding directories. It's when something will go wrong is when we have to look at the build and the install, okay? So it's more of like a uh, after the process or when your catkin is failing for some reason. But that's not all what it takes for any random directory to count as a ROS workspace if it has these three folders. That would be pretty arbitrary. Right? You could just create these dummy folders without any meaningful content and ROS should not consider that as a workspace. Uh, so here's more examples for how the directory structure of a workspace looks as. So we have, you know, at the very top level, we have the root folder. Let's say the root folder's name is workspace underscore folder. We need a source folder. We also need dev and um, um, build, which are not shown here. What I want to show is that within the source folder, there is something called a CMake file, which is the top level file that Catkin requires you don't have to write this file yourself, right? That's the beauty of Catkin. It will automatically create the default file when you run the uh, initialize workspace command. But within the source folder, you can have multiple packages, right? So we have n packages. You have subdirectories, which are the name of the package. So this package could be perception, planning, control, whatever package. Each of the package itself has some special files that we will go into detail towards the end of this lecture. And it's the presence of these files and this particular data structure which enables ROS to compile all of this as a package and as a workspace. Okay, so what is a Catkin workspace? It's just, just this directory structure with the presence of some specific CMake files. Uh, and this is how you typically organize your code. Within the source folder of your Catkin workspace, you can put other folders which are packages. In fact, packages can have their own source subdirectories as well. As, as we have seen, a package is a collection of different nodes. It's not just one ROS node. So with more examples, this will become clear again. Uh, so let's look at you know what is a package directory. So we have the workspace. Within that, we have the source. I said the source can have many, many packages. So here's an example of two different package directories, which could be in the source subdirectory of the Catkin workspace. So here's an example of a package directory. Um, it has all of these folders in itself because a package is a collection of many, many things, services, messages, and nodes. So you see here, and this is a very important point not to get confused, the package directory has its own source subdirectory, which is different from the source directory of the workspace. Okay, it could be confusing that both are called SRC in this example, but let it be settled that you have a root workspace folder within which is source, build, and devil. And within the source, you can have packages which can have their own subdirectories as is shown here. Okay, so that's completely normal. It's allowed in ROS. Right, so a package is a collection of uh, the source files, 
Uh, we've seen examples of messages. We've seen example of services. But there are these other functionalities as well called launch files, which we will you know, get to uh, in subsequent lectures. Uh, and so the reason why you would want multiple packages um, together in the same project, so you can think of your workspace as the entire project folder and these packages as different you know, uh, uh, sort of sub-functionalities of your project. So maybe one part of your project is um, looking only at perception, so getting the data from all the sensors. And so you know, that can have many, many nodes. All of them can be dumped into the source folder of the package. OK, so we are just looking at mostly this bookkeeping stuff as of now. It's still not clear. I haven't explained what is making ROS uh, identify this particular configuration as a package. So this is a bit difficult to see, but it's the same example, but more detailed. We have a workspace root directory. We have a source subfolder in which we have many, many packages from 1 to n. Then we have a build folder. It can have some own uh, files. We can have the development folder, the install folder. So this is a very holistic view of where do packages reside in the entire Catkin workspace. Is it clear? This is just a zoomed in view again. I know this is probably the fourth time we are revisiting this, but I really want there to be no confusion. So we have a Catkin workspace, the three ROS file system requirements. Within the source, there's a default file which is created called CMake list. We'll see the contents of this file. And then we have all our packages, and each of these packages can have their own source folders and messages folders and services folders. Okay, so this is the example of the ROS file system. And the reason why ROS knows that this particular directory is a workspace and this particular subdirectory is a package is because of the way we initialize a directory to be a workspace. Okay, so, so in ROS, we will do this in our lab, but I want to show you how it's done here first. Um, you can create a new directory. So we can call it whatever, katkin underscore ws is just our working example. You can name the workspace whatever you want, as long as it's consistent with file naming rules uh, in Linux. So we can create a directory. In fact, you can see I'm creating a directory and a subdirectory called source, which would be empty since I'm using make dir, then I can change the directory to go to source and run a command called catkin initialize workspace. Okay, so you can create this workspace slash source folder yourself in whatever you know desktop, downloads, whatever directory on your computer you want. Um, then simply go to the source subdirectory of your catkin workspace. And when you run catkin initialize workspace, what it does is it makes this workspace a ROS catkin workspace. So this is what is telling ROS that I'm going to treat the catkin underscore WS and the source folder as the catkin workspace folders. In addition, other things also happen, right? The CMake list file .txt would be created automatically in the source subdirectory. So once you've initialized the workspace to build a workspace, Every time, regardless of whether there are packages in the source folder or not, we would always go to the root of the workspace. So in this case, the root folder is catkin underscore ws. So we change our directory to catkin underscore ws, and we simply run catkin make. And what this will do is it will take everything in the source folder. It will look at the make rules specified in the cmake list.txt, and it will create the build, the devil, the install folders, according to these make rules. So in summary, we created a folder out of thin air. We initialized that as the catkin workspace, vcd dot dot to go to the root from source, and we simply run catkin make. And even in the absence of any source code, you would still have the devil and the build folders created. And when there are packages, it will take a long time for the build process, you know, and it'll throw errors if there's something wrong with the source. So this is how this arbitrary folder that we have created ourselves is being told and categorized to be a Katkin uh, workspace or a ROS workspace. 
through these commands. And this is where the build folders and the context, uh, the contents of the development and installation folders are also automatically getting uh, filled in through the Catkin build system. What is the Catkin build system doing once again? It's simply reading how to compile the code using CMakeList. All right, so a good practice is once you build your, your workspace, you should always source it. What does sourcing mean? Sourcing means that you want to make your host shell or OS aware that this is a new ROS workspace. Otherwise, what will happen is every time you open a terminal, it will not know, it will know where the default ROS is installed, but it will not know that there's this other folder which is also you know, compatible with ROS commands. So the way to do this is after you build, like I said, the build process is going to create the development and the uh, install folders. We won't worry about install. And there's a special file called uh, setup. It's a shell script, which is also created as a result of the build process. You simply source this file. And you can even add it to your uh, terminal bash RC. So every time you open a new terminal, the, you can still do ROS run and then the name of the package within your custom workspace and ROS will be able to find that. In fact, you already have done this without maybe realizing. So when you installed ROS, one of the uh, you know, requirements was you had to source the default directory where ROS is installed on your machine. And the reason for this was that the setup.bash is telling the host OS where are all these default ROS packages installed. So while this works for default packages, our custom workspace could be in any other direct directory. So we have to also tell our host OS that this other directory is also like a ROS workspace. And so sourcing and adding to bash RC is a, is a standard way of doing that. So any, any questions so far on you know, what is a workspace and how do we create a workspace? It's simply a set of commands. Again, you don't have to memorize them. You'll get used to them after we do our lab exercises, but I want to, you to know why we are doing uh, what we are doing. All right, so, so we, like I've said before, this is just making it more explicit, a single workspace, so we have a workspace called WS, within which we have a subdirectory called source, as is required by ROS. So maybe I go into source, I first run Katkin initialize workspace, then I, you know, uh, I can, before even running Katkin build, within the source, like I've said, we can have many, many packages, right? So how do you build multiple packages? you simply put them in the source directory of your workspace. And then you go to your root, which is the workspace folder itself. And when you run Katkin make, it will compile the executables for all the nodes in all the packages while ensuring that all the message dependencies and all the other compilation build dependencies are automatically taken care of. Okay, so it, that's the reason why Katkin is so powerful. Uh, it really makes the whole workflow of building processes uh, very, very straightforward, right? So this is sort of the same point that you have to source your environment after you, uh, after you build the packages. Okay, so I said that a requirement for every package, like a package itself can have, you know, its own source subfolders and its own subdirectories for custom messages and services. The Two things which are really required, without which Ross will throw an error, is every package must contain two files. One file is called package.xml, and this can be treated as the constitution of what this package is supposed to do. Okay, and we'll go through the contents of this file uh, and see some real life examples as well, uh, from turtle sim to a real car. Uh, so we need a package.xml file without which Ross will cry about whether this is a package or not. And every package must have its own CMake file as well, cmakelist.txt file. We've already seen that there is a default cmakelist.txt which is created at the workspace level under source, but this is different. This is for the package which is you know, residing within the source. So again, a bunch of different examples will, uh, will help clarify this. So look at, let's look at turtle sim, right? This is, this is our friendly uh, neighborhood package. So this is the turtle sim 
package folder, not the workspace. And within that, we have these subfolders. We have some folders called launch and include. And then we have a source subdirectory within TurtleSim. And notice that within the source is a C++ file, which is the actual ROS node that we launched. And then there's a service folder as well. And this package has its own cmakelist.txt. In fact, it also has its own package.xml, which is not shown here, but you know, trust me, it exists. We'll see it in just a uh, second. So this is the definition of a ROS package. It's a collection of nodes. Why is it a collection? You can have multiple executables. This executable in ROS is called a ROS node. And this package directory itself needs to have a cmakelist.txt file for the CMake Katkin system, plus it also needs to have a package manifest file called package.xml. And only then will the build process function successfully. Okay, so now let's get familiar with these two requirements of ROS packages, okay? What are the requirements? The first is it, the XML file, package.xml, literally the name of the file is package.xml. Its name is not the name of the package.xml. This is the name of the file, package.xml. It's standard across uh, you know, ROS Kinetic and uh, recent builds. It must be included with any package. And so the purpose of this file is to define the properties and the dependencies of this package with other packages. So this is the first requirement. The second requirement is the package directory must also contain cmakelist.txt. This one is a slightly more complicated file. We won't go over this line by line, but I will still give you an overview uh, of what cmakelist.txt does. Okay, so these are the two requirements that any package folder must satisfy. And then in addition, it can have its own source subfolder, messages, launch, uh, and other uh, sort of functionalities. So previously, we looked at a table which showed what should be the contents of the workspace. And the entries in that table were, it, there needs to be a source subdirectory, a build, a develop, and install. This is telling you what needs to be the contents of a package folder. Okay, they are two different sort of entities, but they are related, of course. So that's why I'm emphasizing uh, the same point again and again. Uh, in a package, you can have your source and other relevant folders where you define your message data structure, your services such as Teleport Absolute, whatever. And then you have the two files which are required, the manifest and the build. And then this entire folder on its own resides in the source subdirectory of some workspace. So I hope that that point is clear now. If not, let's look at one another example. So here's another, literally a screenshot from you know a, a ROS uh, subdirectory. So this is the name of the package, not the workspace. And this package has these subdirectories. Within the source subdirectory, we have the actual ROS nodes, and then it has these two requirements, CMake and XML. And if, yes? Good question, right? So you don't need a header file when you use Python. In fact, it's very common uh, in Python scripts, or if packages only contain Python code, Sometimes the source folder is called a script, and you just put a dot .python, you ch mod it to be executable, and everything will work. And we'll see that. So you know, I went over it quite fast because that's literally one of the lab exercises that is pending. Maybe we'll build a, a node from scratch and a, a Python node from scratch and create this directory structure. So like I said, you know, why do we care? Why, what is the benefit of going through what may look right now as a painful process, but it is actually much, much better than the legacy ROS build? Well, one example is if ROS knows about, knows about your custom workspace and the packages inside your custom workspace, you can really leverage many, many default uh, Unix file system navigation commands and treat them as ROS commands. So for example, right from your 
terminal, regardless of whatever directory you are in, you can simply say ROS change directory and type the name of the package without you know, worrying about where is this located on my system. So as long as you sourced your environment after the build process, this will directly change your current working directory to wherever this package is on your machine. Very, very useful, because you only need to remember package name and not worry about paths where they reside. So similarly, you can use you know, ROS list, copy, edit, anything that you can do with a Linux file, append that command by the ROS prefix, and that should work, as long as these packages exist and you've sourced your environment. So here's an example that we can all relate. So you know, I'm in my home directory, and I say ROS CD turtle sim, so right here, the first command. And um, it gives me the options of which you know, directory in the turtle sim package do I want to go to. I just want to go to the root directory. So when I say ROS CD turtle sim package, look how my current directory has changed to where turtle sim is on my machine. And I didn't have to worry about where this was. Why is this useful? Because you know, well, when you are working on your code, you have to go sometimes and edit your code. So you need to CD to the directory where your Python script exists. And it'll be a nightmare to always you know, type all this jargon to get to that path. So you can just say raw CD path, raw CD name of the package, and you'll be directly changed directory into that package. Right? Similarly, you can, maybe you don't want to change directories. You want to just list the contents of a package without going there. You can say ROS list or ROS ls. And here I want to list the contents of a subdirectory within the package. And it, it's showing me the contents of total sim slash images, which is a subfolder in the total sims package by default, uh, right from my home directory without changing anything. So very, very time saving, efficient, and convenient. Uh, if you are wondering, by the way, what these images are, these are the images of the turtles, okay, which reside in the, the total sim images uh, directory. So, so hopefully, you know, this gives you an appreciation for why Catkin exists, because it allows you to save time, not just in uh, you know, your user interface and working with files, but also very, very heavily and predominantly in the build aspects of compiling these different uh, source codes and different packages. All right, so where do these two files come from? Okay, so uh, previously I said that when you initialize a directory as a workspace, the CMake list.txt is created at the workspace level. But similarly, when you initialize something as a package, these files are also created by default by the Catkin build system. You don't have to create these files from scratch. Catkin build will give you the template for whatever package you are compiling, and you just, at the very uh, you know, least, have to go and edit those templates. You don't have to write these uh, packages from scratch. So here's an example, and again, don't worry about uh, remembering these commands because we'll do a lab on this. So previously, we created a Catkin workspace and we created a source subfolder. We initialized this as the Catkin init workspace and maybe we also did Catkin make. Now, when I'm within the source folder, I can use a new command called Catkin create package. Very intuitive. Catkin create package, the name of the package, let's say the name is beginner tutorials, and then I list some other packages which are the dependencies of beginner tutorials. So the format of the command is not shown here, but the format is catkin create package followed by the name of the package followed by a list of dependencies of that package. And it is through running this command that the package.xml and the cmake list for the package are auto-created by catkin. So again, very, very useful. Uh, and so let's say you know we create this beginner tutorials within the source subdirectory. Uh, what, what do we do if we want to run the package or the nodes within beginner tutorials? Uh, we can navigate to the root of the workspace, which is just this subdirectory right here. We can say cat can make, and it will update the setup.bash to reflect that there's a new package now. So next time I am on my terminal, I can say ROS run, and maybe I just say begin and hit tab, and it will auto-complete beginner tutorials because it knows due to the setup.bash file that this new package was just compiled in this workspace. And this is not the default workspace on my machine where ROS is installed. It could be anywhere. 
Is it clear or confusing? I just want some feedback to know uh, how much more time to spend on this. Straightforward, but once again, when we do this in the lab is maybe you know, when you have more questions to ask. Okay, so another reason why you would want to use Katkin, you don't really have an option to not use it, but I'm just telling you why it's very useful. Uh, sometimes you, know, you would want to run a package and it will not work as expected. So there's a command called ROS pack, short for ROS package. It has many, many options. One very useful one is you can list the dependencies of any package. So previously we just created this beginner tutorial and specified manually that you know, it depends upon standard messages, ROS Python and ROS C++ packages. Uh, now I'm just telling you that ROS pack depends. Why does it say depends one? Because I'm only interested in the first degree of dependencies. I can also say, well, what does ROS CPP depend upon? List that as well. So we can keep going down the rabbit hole as much as we want. Okay, so, so once again, let's revisit our familiar package. If I say ROS pack depends one turtle sim, it tells me these are all the packages on which turtle sim depends on. You know, so, so someone you know, had a question that uh, you know, when I tried to uh, you know, run some command velocity or some twist message, it didn't work or uh, you might want to check whether this package actually exists on your machine. And so you, some of these are, uh, hopefully, you know, you can recall them, especially like geometry message is the package which had the twist message file. So that's obviously a dependency of, of total sim. Okay, so finally, you know, let's quickly uh, look at what is the actual content of these two very, very critical files, package.xml uh, and cmakeslist.txt. Um, so at some level, the XML file, like I said, is like a manifest or a constitution of what this package is supposed to do. So some of the stuff is just what you can call uh, metadata. So things like what was the name of the package, what is the version of the package, description, the email ID of the person who's responsible for maintaining this package, the license under which this package can be distributed. Uh, so typical you know, header of any uh, source uh, code file. Uh, but the important part is it lists a bunch of dependencies of the package itself. So the XML file is really where we are listing different types of dependencies. Uh, what do I mean by different types of dependencies? We can have build time dependencies. So when I have to compile my code, what other dependencies are of other packages, right? So I need ROS Python and ROS C++ to be available for compiling, for instance. Then there could be runtime dependencies, whereas uh, these are the libraries that, you know, you, the ROS must fetch underneath the hood when the node is running. And we still require, you know, these packages to also be running underneath the hood. And then there could be, uh, you know, some, um, some testing dependencies as well. Uh, once again, this is beyond the scope of what we would be working on. But when you work with large projects, you want to have some specific testing tools that are also to be invoked to enable, you know, some better debugging um, uh, and better analysis of your code. So very, very quick descriptions of some of examples of some of these. So, um, I know this seems like a very silly thing to show that you know we all know what description is, but but I have put this slide here for a purpose to um, make a very good point that your description of a ROS node or a ROS package should be very concise. If your package is doing you know 20 different things, maybe it shouldn't be a single package. It can be broken down into simpler packages itself that you can reuse later, right? So the description is a good idea to gauge what is really what I want from this particular package or from this particular node. Uh, so that's why the only point here is it should be very concise yet descriptive. Uh, you know, the tags you can fill in with your own uh, name and email, you will do that for your lab assignments. So we know that you are the one who wrote the, wrote the code and everything. Um, and you know we also have some assignment checkers which can automatically send you an email based on what is shown in the package XML manifest. Um, the license, there are a bunch of different options. I won't spend too much time. You can use BSD or MIT, uh, free open source developing license. And this is really where the important part is. We have to list 
different type of dependencies in package.xml. Some of them are automatically filled when you use the command cat can create package, because remember in that command you also listed which packages are the dependent packages, so they're getting automatically filled here. Uh, but in some cases, um, you know, you may want to edit this file. So the, the good news is we don't have to create this file from scratch, we just have to edit it. But sort of the bad news is we need to be careful about uh, editing this file, right? So just so that you know what is happening, uh, pretty much from 27 to 37, everything is commented out. So, you know, let's look at build tool underscore dependency. There's only a single tool required to actually build this entire package, and that's Katkin, so pretty obvious. And then there are some uh, build time dependencies of the C++, Python, and standard messages, uh, which are also required. But in addition, you know, you can have uh, additional dependencies, which are runtime or execution dependencies as well. Uh, and so that's the whole purpose of the package.xml file. Um, you know, in our initial stages of the F110 uh, labs, they will work for the most part. But as you start developing your own code and it doesn't work, or you are integrating some ROS package into your own code and it doesn't work, these are the things that we have to revisit and fix. Uh, so I'm, I'm literally pointing the laser on where you have to look for when things don't work. And that's the whole reason why we are going into in-depth uh, of these uh, very, very important files. A lot of dependencies, but that's still manageable. It's not, it's not too big. Okay, so a good practice is that your name of your package.xml should be the same name as the directory's name, right? So remember how package itself is a directory with its own subfolders and these dependencies and these uh, custom file names. So it's good practice to, to have those two match. Uh, Katkin likes that. Uh, I have seen some instances where this is not true, but I would advise you to, you know, uh, stick with the, this convention. Uh, so we, you know, some of these tools are automatically filled, but some of the dependencies we can change uh, depending on what behavior we want. And there's other things we can also, uh, you know, specify in the XML. Uh, we do, we will cover what is called a nodelet. In, the, in this course, but for now, you can think of this as having, a, you know, an, an external tool also being a dependency. So this is not a package, but this is another tool that you want your package to have access to. And so you can use a nodelet for, for those kind of tasks. So I won't go into as much detail in the cmakelist.txt file, but essentially this is the make file, right? So like any software compiler, uh, we also have to tell Katkin on how do you actually compile, where is the default directory, where ROS is, where are all the other dependent directories. So you see all these macros of, you know, where are the included directories, where are the libraries. This is all specified in the make file. Uh, unlike the package.xml file, you can see this is not very uh, intuitive. So it's very complex and non-intuitive. Uh, because this is meant for like a machine to read and automatically dynamically link the dependencies in the correct folders and messages and all that stuff. So the, the typical way we would work with make files is we would not change a whole lot, but um, we, we typically, you know, uh, some uncomment or edit some, some relevant lines. So if, you are, if your package is using some custom messages which are not uh, supported natively by ROS and are residing in some user-defined directory, uh, the make file needs to know where that directory is. You know? So that sort of stuff. And whenever that is the case, we will always point you towards what you have to change in the make file. Right? So unlike the package.xml, uh, this is not a very intuitive file to, uh, uh, to basically wrap your head around. And you know, as with real-world software development, it's true for ROS as well. You find a package which is similar to your package, you copy the make file, and then you debug from there, okay? It's, a, it's standard practice uh, in, in, in getting your stuff to work. Right, so uh, here's a very short example of a, uh, of a make file. Usually, it's much, much larger than this. This one is for some Python code. So we have, you know, the name of the project. Uh, we are telling Katkin to fetch these message generation and standard messages libraries that this tutorial depends upon. We are adding some custom message files. So we are saying, you know, uh, this macro directory is automatically 
fetched by the build system and it knows where floats.message and this header string and all these other custom message and service files are located. Uh, and you know, then these default, val default things in the make template are uncommented in this case. Uh, so just to give you an intuition, again, don't worry about you know, knowing each and every line of uh, the make file. I doubt there are uh, very few ROS developers who actually even know all the lines of the make file. Uh, it's not you know, something which is terribly complicated. It's just not of interest to us because the default template usually works well. And whenever there's a change, we will tell you, you know, here's where you have to make the change or uncomment this line. So the whole point is you know, when we say in the lab or in the tutorial, that you have to update the make file to do this, you know what we are talking about, okay? So that's the take home message over here. You can do this for C++ as well. Um, so like I said, you know, Total Sim is a good example of adhering to all of these requirements of what a package is. Um, and in fact, you know, the, you will often find uh, uh, that I explain a concept and then I'm usually lying about some things or hiding away a few uh, subtle details so that the point is clear. So there's a subtle detail even in this very simple picture, okay? So, so if you actually go to your ROS CD turtle sim, that directory will not look like this, <laughs> okay? So I, I, I'm sort of misrepresenting what the turtle sim package is. So however, nothing is broken. I'll tell you why that is the case. So, so any ROS or majority of the ROS packages, when you go to their wiki page, a link to their GitHub is always provided. And Turtle Sim is no exception. So this is the real source code of Turtle Sim from Git. And you can see that the package structure is exactly what we expect a ROS package to be. Right? So uh, it has some subfolders of messages and services. It has a source subdirectory. And then there's the CMake and the package.xml file exactly what every package has to respect. So Total Sim is no exception to that rule. Uh, in fact, you know, if we go to the source subfolder, so we are now in Total Sim backslash source, we can see this is where the actual ocean simulator also resides, the source file for that, okay? And you may be wondering, well, where are these other packages like teleopkey and whatnot? Um, so here's you know, the first example of breaking a rule that I already showed you. Um, although Total Sim is contained inside a source folder, you can still rename this to something else. Only the workspace nomenclature is standardized. So the workspace must have a source folder within which the package resides, but this doesn't have to be called source. In fact, tutorials is actually some more source code. So if we go into the tutorials subfolder, you will find there's more source code, including our familiar teleop turtle key C++ file. Okay, so, so in the package, you can organize your code however meaningfully you want. It's just intuitive and standard to you know, push all the code in the source subdirectory, but there's exceptions. Total Sim, the very famous tutorial, is already an exception of that. So while there is an exception, there are some things which you cannot circumnavigate, which is getting rid of these definitions. So actually, let's take a look at, so this is the package.xml file of Total Sim, And don't expect you to read it, but I want you to know it's there because it didn't exist in that screenshot. So you know, if there are some major bugs or breakthroughs that you uh, have uh, found in Total Sim, uh, Dirk Thomas from the Open Source Robotics Foundation should be able to support your GitHub issue. And that's the reason why this manifest exists. Without these manifests, you are not allowed to publish a ROS package, pretty much, right? So you can't use the, uh, the Bloom uh, launch tool. Okay, so why is there a discrepancy? The GitHub is all consistent with what we expect. So what I meant is, if we go to the total sim package directory using ROS change directory, we will be sent to this path where total sim exists. And then I say, list the contents of this directory. I don't see any source files or any CMake or package. I see package.xml, but I don't see any CMake list. I don't see uh, any source subdirectory like I saw on the Git. 
So what is going on? So everything is still consistent. The only small caveat here is for these default packages, ROS has organized itself such that the source is actually not present in this package folder. There's a different folder within the default distribution that you have downloaded where the source files are presented. In fact, I'll convince you of that. If you actually go to you know, where ROS is installed on the machine and list the contents of that entire distribution directory, there's a subdirectory called library. And within the library directory, we have all the source code of all the packages, including TurtleSim. And so you can now go to this new path, which is not something that you will end up if you do ROS CD TurtleSim. That's the whole point. Uh, I just want you to get convinced that you know, TurtleSim is still a ROS package on your system. Now let's go into the actual source folder in the library of the distribution of ROS installed on your Linux machine. Uh, and sure enough, when we list the contents of this source directory, we find this is our node and this is our teleop node. So when you said ROS on TurtleSim teleop node, uh, TurtleSim node and TurtleSim teleop key, these are the files which are getting executed, okay? So it's just the way these default packages are organized, which is why this is an exception. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure you know, that you, uh, if you have that question or you are trying to follow along later or even uh, revisit these slides, uh, it is still consistent with what you have installed on your machine. Okay, so let's wrap up with a real world example. Enough of turtles and uh, simulators and all this theory. Um, so remember AutoWare? I introduced very, very briefly that AutoWare is one of the largest uh, well-maintained, fully open source um, perception planning and control software that if you had the right car, a Lincoln MKZ with the right kind of sensors, you can literally just flash a computer with the AutoWare software and that car should drive by itself. And I know some of you had concerns about safety and liability, but AutoWare is all based on ROS. So technically speaking, it should also follow the same requirements like any ROS package. So let's convince ourselves of that. This is the source code of AutoWare. Uh, it's very well maintained, even though some commits are you know, several years ago. That just goes to show that it's stable. Um, so this is the package of the, this is the ROS subdirectory in the source. AutoWare is a very complex software. It has many, many different uh, attributes. We are mostly interested in the ROS components. So if we look at the source folder within ROS, here is a list of all the packages that AutoWare uses in ROS. Okay, so um, since this is just a screenshot of the Git page, uh, the descriptions are not that uh, you know interpretable, but we can guess you know that there are some packages in sensing. These are probably the packages which enable planning. This drive works. I'm just guessing, and these are some you know packages which are responsible for sending commands to the steering and the acceleration, which is in the actuation part. Um, so all of these are packages under the source subfolder of some workspace in AutoWare, and. If we go to one of these packages, I think I have an example from sensing. So now look at my path. I am in AutoWare ROS source in this folder called sensing. And within that, I have reached a package called image processor. And what I want you to notice is that this is exactly the same required structure as TurtleSim, which again goes to show if you can get your turtle to be autonomously swimming in the ocean, you can get a car also running by itself. So it also has its own package.xml file, a CMake list file. And just like I said, the reason why I showed you the exception, the source folder is just renamed nodes. That's all it is. We can, in fact, go to the nodes. So my path has now, oh, okay, first I want to show you the package XML. It follows the same stuff. Build tool dependency, Katkin, exactly the same as our beginner tutorial, okay? There's additional dependencies, so there's some other build process called AutoWare build flags, which is expected. This is a massive you know, software, so it needs maybe some specific build flags, which are inputs to the CMake system. Uh, it has some build dependencies of ROS C++, some message dependencies. Uh, since this is an image processor, there are some computer vision bridges, which are also a dependent package, and then it has some runtime dependencies. But 22 lines of code is the manifest of the 
image processor uh, package within AutoWare, which is a real system. Okay, and if you go, like I said, you know the the source folder is renamed nodes, so it may not be visible, but we are an image processor slash nodes, and then this is the actual source code of the ROS node, one of the ROS node. It has many, many ROS nodes, right? So this one, what is it called? It's called image rectifier. I am not sure what it does, but uh, that's not the point here. The point is uh, whatever we are learning, it applies to this turtle sim, it applies to F110, and it applies to the real deal. And that's important, and that should give you uh, appreciation for why ROS is so widely used uh, for these sort of tasks, because the same stuff works at scale. It's very robust. All right, so to conclude, the whole point of today's lecture was to show you that ROS has a very specific file structure requirements in order to deal with nodes which are packaged together uh, into something called packages. So packages simply a collection of ROS nodes, messages, services, uh, other cool stuff. So you have you know, uh, a directory structure with all of these folders and two important files which uh, are not listed here explicitly, but every package must have a XML manifest which tells the dependencies and uh, sort of metadata about the package and the maintainer and its function, and it must have a CMake list.txt file which is an input to the Katkin build system. So all of this together is a package. And we just saw an example of a sensing package or you know, an image uh, sort of parsing package from AutoWare. So you can have many, many packages in the same source workspace, very common. Uh, and so a collection of packages is sometimes called a stack. So you may, you know, when you read about you know, some Tesla's code base or some real world uh, autonomous driving talk or a paper, people refer to this is the perception stack, this is the planning stack, this is the control stack. Um, while they are loosely sometimes using the word stack as a collection of software uh, in ROS, it has a meaning that it's a collection of packages. And then you can have many, many stacks, versions of stacks. And anybody wants to guess what a collection of stack is called? What would you call it? You can just yell it out loud. There's no wrong answer, so it's a very low risk question. <laughs> so sometimes a collection of stack is called a repository, which is the intuitive answer, but many times it's called a distribution. Okay, so this is, this is just uh, some lingo and jargon uh, that you may come across. I want you to know what it means. So that's it for, for the uh, next step, which was getting familiar with the ROS workspace and the build system. Uh, it's very, very important, you know, and we will, this will become second nature by the time you get to working with the real car. Uh, but you needed to know this to attempt the first assignment. And so next week, we will have a lab session uh, that will cover this. But it will also, next week, we will start going into writing our own notes, which is where the exciting stuff begins. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, you are again free to leave a little bit early and I'll see you next week.